Let me ask you a question. What is the lunchtime kind of procedure for your work or for a group that you're a part of? Do you bring your lunch or do you go out for lunch? Do you are expected to eat as a group and, and you know share a common lunch or do you spread it out and just kind of everybody does their own thing? And how do you know these things? I mean, how are these things determined? And how did you discover that or figure that out in the group or place where you work? Same thing with Zoom. You know, now that we're all, you know, I'm working from home. A lot of people are working from home or meeting from home, doing classes from home. When you're on these Zoom meetings, right? What's what's the proper etiquette for, for getting off of that meeting, for, for closing things out? And I don't mean like clicking the leave meeting button. I'm talking about, you know, do you do you wave? Do you just say goodbye? Do you just, as as the, the guys on my favorite po podcast, Smartless, would say, do you just slap the laptop closed when you're done? You know, at the end of it, you just slap it shut, right? That's their favorite move at the end of their interviews. Well, determining these things really comes down to what is the norm for that group? These are the things that are, you know, some simple things, but they're things that are determined by group norms. Norms are, are just um, things that guide group behavior and, and conduct. So as we're going to discuss today, we're going to talk about establishing and maintaining group norms, what they are, why they're important, and, uh, and how we can you know, use them effectively in groups. So we're going to focus on group norms. In order to do that, let's define group norms. What do we mean by group norms? Well, norms very simply are formal or informal expectations of group members that are established by the group. So again, these can be things that are explicit rules that they're in the employee handbook or whatever are written down in your in your group charter. And, and you know, they can be that explicit or they can just be things like you notice everybody else is doing this and this is the way the group does it without having laid down some explicit rule. It could be informal like that. Um, and it may just be, a, you know, a social norm as well that, that is influencing the group. But uh, but we have these formal or, or informal expectations of group members that are established by the group. That's what we mean by group norm. So some characteristics or, or things that we know to be true about group norms or things to note about group norms, important factors here. First, norms summarize and simplify group influence processes, right? So uh, they, they just very simply they simplify things. They, they give us some guidelines. We don't have that paralysis by analysis, right, where we're not sure about how to handle this or what to do. The group has already determined this in the case of a norm. This is how things are going to be handled. This is how we're going to we're going to operate in this group and, and in this team. So you don't have to worry about that. We just do it. Right? We can just do it. Then we don't have to you know, you know, recreate the wheel every time we do something. So it simplifies processes in that way. And it, and it summarizes uh, things in, in general for a group. Now, it is important to note that norms apply only to behavior. They do not hopefully apply to private thoughts or feelings. That's that's something different. Really, we're kind of getting into, in some ways, group thinking and some other things. But norms, we're talking just about behavior. We're not talking about trying to, to guide and, and direct the way people think or the way they feel about things, um, just the way we do things that typically are, are repetitive or, or commonplace activities or expectations within the group. Norms are generally developed only for behaviors that are viewed as important by most group members. So one group member has this one thing that th that's really important to them. But if the other group members, if the majority of the group doesn't feel like it's an important thing to have as a norm, then it won't be a norm. Just because one person feels like it should be something, um, it won't become a norm really, usually unless it's something that is, uh, that is important or viewed as important for the majority of the group members. Norms you should usually develop gradually, but the process can be quickened if members wish. So typically a norm is just something that develops out of habit. You know, it's, it's something that how you, a group does it once and it works, so they do it again. And then slowly it just becomes the norm and the expectation that that's the way it be done. It doesn't have to be that slowly. It doesn't have to occur that way. There are times when, you know, something abrupt happens in a group and a group will say, okay, no, this is how we're going to handle this from in the future. So now we're going to have this very direct, you know, establishment of a norm or rule um, that, that will handle that specific thing. So it can be quick. And, but usually it's just little things that happen um, over, over time gradually, right? That become just the way things are done then. And all norms do not apply to all members. There may be different rules depending on your and different norms, depending on your specific role um, or depending on, you know, some specific factor or characteristic that has to do with the group member. It may be different for that particular group member. And so not all norms apply to all members. It's important to remember that as well. OK, so these, those are just some of the, the basics of, of norms, just some some guidelines and to, things to keep in mind about norms. But. Let's talk a little bit about the functions of norms. What do norms do 
within a group. Well, first of all, norms facilitate group survival, right? This is why in the olden days, you know, when, when you had these wagon trains that were heading out west and, and settlers and explorers were going out west, they would at the at the end of the day, they would when they were getting ready to camp for the night, they would circle their wagons, right? So we get that expression. We circle the wagons for safety, for safety against uh, animals to provide protection and, and kind of a a 360 degree viewpoint for, um, uh, for, for protection against animals and so, and different, you know, outlaws or different attackers like that. So when we say circle the wagons, what that really is doing is helping to facilitate group survival. It's putting us in the best position then. And that's kind of what happens with norms. Norms help us circle the wagons then and, and give us these process of what happens in an emergency, what happens when this happens, you know, when A happens, we do B so we can get to C, right? So it helps us facilitate that group survival and uh, it helps us um, be prepared for those situations when we have to implement these types of things. It also simplifies uh, the expected behaviors in a group. Right? It can simplify the expected behaviors instead of, as I said, uh, paralysis by analysis or this loop-de-loop -loop squiggly line thing from A to B. Now we have a clear process from A to B. And when A happens, we do B. And then we move on, move on from there. It's not a lot of hemming and hawing and decision making and, and, you know, questioning and that kind of thing. It's just here it is. This happened. So now this is this is what we do as a result. It simplifies those expected behaviors, allows group members to know, OK, when this happens, this should be my response. It can help us avoid embarrassing situations, right? When we know the norms of a group or the expected behaviors, then we can avoid embarrassing situations. Most of us know when we get on an elevator, you know, you're supposed to face forward, look at the numbers, don't talk to people, just keep your eyes straight ahead. I've, this is elevator etiquette, right? There's there's all kinds of little social norms that we have, um, but this is one, you know, and, and unless you get that one one weird guy who comes in and just stands backward and just stares at people, that's, that's you know, makes everybody uncomfortable, right? Well, a norm can help us avoid that type of situation by knowing, oh, this is how we, hate, this is how this group handles things, this is how group behaves and so i want to you know i can follow that procedure then it can also help us identify the group and express its central values to others right so it can help us set that group apart and identify what we're doing here sorry so uh, in some hospitals not all but in some hospitals and healthcare facilities you'll see people different scrubs and sometimes those scrubs will be color coded right you know if you're wearing one collar it means you're on the surgical floor and you're a surgical nurse or something like that and one color is for phlebotomists or medical assistants and or CNAs or whatever so they have different scrub co color coding systems so they can identify groups and then, you know, express what it is that group does to other people very quickly. Whether you know that person or not, you can identify based on their scrub color what they do. Other groups have very specific norms, like the military. It's a very specific norm about appearance, right? They're very picky about how, how long your hair can be, and you have to be clean shaven and so forth, right? So you can identify somebody in the military a lot of times by their dress, by their manner. But even within the military, then we have different groups because you see these special forces people Special Forces guys that grow long beards and grow shaggy hair because they need to do so in, in case they're, you know, inserted into a country uh, undercover, right? So to, so to speak, right? They're incognito. They need to be able to blend in. So they have to have the ability to have different, uh, if they look like they're straight out of boot camp in the military, then they're going to stand out. So they need to be able to have these different characteristics. So within the military, you can kind of identify in some ways, oh, that must be somebody in special forces or some sort of special group because they're not required to, to have to stick to the, the grooming standards uh, that everybody else has. They have a different standard. So it can identify that group and, and express their values to others, their, you know, what they do and, and, uh, and, you know, so those things that are important. So group norms uh, facilitate a lot of different things within a group. So there are lots of different functions, but these are some of the basic functions of group norms and what they can do, what, how they're helpful in a group, the benefits that they can offer. One important thing that happens within groups, though, that we have to think about with norms is we have to socialize people when they come in. When you get a new group member, they've got to be acclimated. They've got to be socialized into that group and taught what that group is and, and and what we're doing and how to do those things, right? So there, there are a couple different categories here that we need to consider. First is the technical knowledge. They need to know how to do what you want them to do. They need to, to be taught the different aspects of their role and their job and how to do different functions. And, and so these are like the task related things that we're, that we're talking about here. They need that technical knowledge and that's something we have to give them as well. Every job is different. Every group is different. So when somebody comes in, we've got to teach them 
how to do what we need them to do and how we want them to do it as a group, right? So we need to give them that technical knowledge. We also need to provide them then with that social knowledge, the social knowledge, which is kind of the, the, the more gray area part of this. It's the behavioral expectations and the relational expectations that we have within that group. How do we talk to each other? How do we communicate with one another? Not only literally in a sense of, do we email, do we call, do we whatever, but how formal are we? Are we joking? Are we doing, you know, are we, are we more formal? Are we less formal? Are we do those types of things? Is it okay to joke around? Is it, uh, it, you know, just in general, who do we talk to and, and how do we talk to them and not just communicating, but just how do we behave in these situations? What are some of the, the lesser known rules that, that might exist for this group? So one example I can give you is that when I was growing up, I used to work at, a, at an amusement park near my home, just a small little regional theme park um, that happened to be by my hometown. And I was a ride supervisor there. And uh, so we had new people that we had to train all the time, all summer long. We had new people coming in, we had to train them. And, uh, and so, um, so, uh, we had to train them. Obviously when they came, we had to train them on the, on a specific ride, for example, whatever ride they were going to be running that day. We had to make sure they understood how to operate it. Um, what common issues come up with customers, how to prop, you know, what safety measures and that kind of thing. We had to give them all the technical knowledge for that ride in general. But then also part of our job was to give them the social knowledge of how do things work around here? You know, when can you expect your break? And when you have your break, you know, if you have this supervisor, if you had a 15 minute break, this super, one supervisor would expect you back at 15 minutes. They'd be timing it, right? Other supervisors, you can push a little bit, 17, 18 minutes. They're not quite as specific on that, but we got to understand that as well. So we would try and, you know, as you know, employees, you try and share that information. Where do you, you know, where do you go to get the best um, deal on food and where's the best place to get some privacy and just get away from uh, customers and, and things like that. And as a ride person, we would share with them, you know, don't talk to the lifeguards because they're jerks, right? <laughs> so there was kind of a rivalry there. All of that social knowledge that we had to share to socialize those, that person as well. And, uh, and so we gave them all the technical knowledge they needed and all the social knowledge, but there was, and there's a lot to it. It's slow going. It takes a long time to get acclimated to a group, fully acclimated into a group. So, um, so we have to share all of that different kind of information with them on all the different norms. Right? Now there's one, you know, thing that we need to consider in terms of the, the norm and conform balancing act, because norming implies that you want to go along with the group, that you're going to fall into line with what the group wants you to do. But at the same time, there's, there's this risk of conforming and becoming just a, a, a you know, a, just this automatic, you know, not a real person, just kind of doing what's expected of you and, and not really thinking for yourself. That's a danger as well. First of all, because then the group loses out on your perspective and things. And, and part of the, the benefit of group work is that you get all these people with different perspectives. So you should be able in a group to stand up and say, no, I think that's, that may not be right. And you want to do it in a way that's appropriate, right? And within kind of the larger group guidelines, but you want to be able to say, no, I think maybe we should do it this other way, or we should think about this instead. Um, so you don't want to fall into that balance, into that, into that um, category of you're just following along and not really thinking. Right. But it's, but you do want to recognize those norms and follow them as much as possible because that is what makes the group run smoothly. If you're constantly questioning every norm that there is, um, just because, just because you want to not conform, then you're going to just slow the group down. It's going to get bogged down in those details again, paralysis by analysis. These norms are there to speed things up, but when one needs to be questioned, you ought to be able to question it. Okay. So we need to kind of keep that balancing act in mind between norms and conform. You don't want to, want to not get too caught up in either one of those things. Hopefully this gives you a better idea of what norms are, how they benefit groups, how they impact groups in general, um, and, and the, the role that they have in groups and, and in being socialized into a group. If you have questions about group norms or anything else related to small group communication, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. And in the meantime, I hope that you'll be able to now recognize some of the group norms and, and identify those to follow when appropriate and question when one may need to be questioned.